and welcome to the Lean and Agile show. I'm your host, Shaheen, and I have Alan Holop, um, a famous speaker and um, a very renowned, I would say, software craftsmanship. And I would um, ask him to introduce himself, but hi, Alan, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Shaheen, happy to be here. So for myself, for the listeners that they don't know you, will you please tell us who Alan is? <laughs> You know, nobody's ever asked me to do that before. I, d- I don't know. I've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this since dinosaurs ruined the earth. I um, started out, actually, I started out doing hardware design. Right out of school, I was a hardware engineer doing robotics work. Right. And in the process of doing that, we were using CPUs that we didn't have compilers for. So I had to learn how to write a compiler. And by the oh. time I got done writing the compiler, then I had to write an operating system because there wasn't an operating system for the for machine that. either. And <laughs> by the time all the dust settled, I was a software guy instead of a hardware guy. But right. <laughs> right. And things have moved on from there. You know, right. I wrote for Dr. Dobbs for years. I've, I've done a lot of stuff, spoken at a lot of conferences, at least while there were still conferences happening, as we'll see how that, how that goes. How that I'm, goes yeah. I'm scheduled for a bunch of stuff in Europe in the autumn, as we'll see. But... Um, right things are open or not and what is the main theme of the conferences that you or the main community that um, you're talking at or speaking at Uh, you know i i software is in other words the the i don't particularly like the notion of agile being something separate than software it's all software development that we're talking about right 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 And, and agile has turned into this horrific thing that doesn't mean anything anymore the word has become meaningless right and so I'm kind of reluctant to position myself as an agile guy sometimes because the word is such snake oil is that the, the scrum certification people have turned it into garbage. Right. So the way that I look at it is we're all just making software and there are some good ways to do that and there are bad ways to do that. And I can help you make it better, better software. Yeah. <laughs> make better software better, right? Is it, a, right. I, you know, I can help you with process and stuff. And of course I'll draw from real agile thinking, not, not the fake stuff, but real agile right. thinking and lean and, lots of other things, right? There's lots of, there's lots of moving parts here and lots of pieces right. that interconnect with each other in order to, in order to be able to do things well. So right. that's, I don't want to limit myself to what agile has come to mean right. nowadays. Right. So a lot of the conferences I talk to then are just general software conferences is they're not, they're not agile. Conferences. Agile. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. You know. Yeah. When you were describing um, about yourself, uh, mm-hmm. It reminded me of one of professors or instructors at ba- back in Iran when I was doing my software engineering bachelor. And at that time, you 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 would do two years, and after two years, you decide between a software a specialization or hardware specialization. Mm-hmm. So for the first two years, I picked both syllabus, and then at the two years. But this professor that I had, he was he was telling me that it's not about software or hardware; it's about the mindware. So the, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all about how your mind can solve the puzzles, right? Yeah. And when you were talking about Agile and it's not the silver bullet, it's about like how can we make the software in combination of in other, all the other things make it better? Well, it's all the same pieces too. You know, you look at, you can describe a hardware circuit board as software. Right. People do that literally nowadays, right, right, with PLAs and stuff. But even when it's discrete components, right, is that a, a, a servo is a loop. And right. you could code it up as a loop as you wanted to, or you can implement the loop in hardware, but a loop right. is a loop. It's, it's got a termination condition. It's got feedback. It does, you know, it does what it does. So um, the, the differences are, are not as, as large as people right. think that they are, right. I think. I think you're right. Yeah. Right. So let's go back to, um, to Agile. Because mm-hmm. this is, is the show called Lean on Agile and right. Elevate Change. So it's all about we are leaning on Agile and you talk about fake Agile and real Agile. So yeah. tell us more about the people that are new to Agile, the people that are m- maybe more time spent with Agile or, or in the software. Not, let's not um, just um, close it off to Agile people. In the software, how do you, what are the real Agile or, and what can they get from that so that Probably. they use it? If whatever you're doing is called agile, it probably isn't. We can okay. start there, right? Scrum is not agile anymore. Um, safe is the opposite of agile. Right. Um, so, the if you if you you know I know a few of the people who were signatures to the original agile manifesto, and I talk to them occasionally. And most of the people that I know that are the original agile people don't want to have anything to do with the word anymore. It's come to mean this horrific thing that has to do with 
prescribed process and managers telling people what to do and everybody in the organization marching in lockstep doing the same process and starting their sprints on the same day and just all of this craziness. It's just garbage. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't help you elevate change. It's that Agile is all about agility. Mm-hmm. And if you have a rigid process, you have no agility. So the, the, um, the word has come to mean something not very good. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the original Agile, though, it's really um, the things that people were doing in the late 90s, which was translated into the Agile Manifesto as best as those guys could do it, right? Those were, of course, just a dozen dozen people. Right. There are lots of people that were deep thinkers in the area that were not at Snowbird. And, um, but the, the, they did a pretty good job of putting together sort of general thinking principles and values about what it means to build software in an Agile, in the English sense, way, in a flexible and, and uh, nimble way. And I think it still pretty much holds. There's a lot of, there's stuff in that document that um, I think needs to be changed. Not, that's not so much that the document needs to be changed, but we've learned a lot since then. Right. right? So it talks about a, a, an iteration being anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And I think most of us would laugh at that anymore as we're now we're talking a couple of hours to a couple right. of days. Right. right? And um, they talk about projects and, nowadays, at least in the last three or four years, we've kind of come to realize that thinking in terms of projects is not a good thing. We need to be thinking in terms of the product as a whole. Right. But generally speaking, it's all pretty, the stuff that's there is pretty good, right? The, okay. the, the core stuff is all things like, like give people the tools and the freedom that they need to work and then let them work, right? And right. it all has to do with collaboration and, and trust and um, things that don't seem to come up in the context of what they call Agile nowadays. Right. You look at safe, and safe is the opposite of trust. Right. Right. Safe is this big prescribed process that tells you how to do everything, and it's all con- heavily controlled, and there's a lot of hierarchy there. And, and trust is, though, as far as I'm concerned, at the sen- center of doing stuff in an agile way. Because if you really want to be, want to be flexible, if you're really right. trying to be flexible, right. the people that are doing the software, writing the software, have to be able to make the changes that are necessary right, right then. Right? Right. Talk to a customer, you find out something needs to change, you change it. Right. If you've got to go through some elaborate process, you can't do that, and you lose your agility. Yeah. So you have this this uh, war right. between traditional waterfall companies who will not give up that thinking, but they yeah. say somehow they're agile. They bring in a couple of scrum trainers who are selling their snake oil, and they get a bunch of certificates, and they say, "Yeah, we're agile now," and they're not, right? Because right? right. the there's no flexibility. Right. So my, my acid test is that if a if a customer comes along and says, I, I really desperately need this, can you have it to them in a day or two? Right. If you can't, there's no agility. Would you think that is it is is where we are at is because that Scrum is become the fam- the most famous of the agile frameworks? I don't want to call it framework methodologies or mindsets uh, because it's not a methodology. Well, yeah, yeah. Scrum is Scrum is a framework. Framework, yeah. It's just a framework. But really what we're talking about here is the marketing ability of Jeff Sutherland. Right. And, you know, when Jeff and Ken split apart into Scrum Inc. and Scrum Org a few years ago, uh, my heart went with Ken. As I, th- I, think, I think Ken really still understands what Agile means, and he still is trying to teach it as best he can. I think Jeff has gone completely off the deep end, I, mm-hmm. to be honest. Maybe I shouldn't say that in public, but <laughs> <laughs> I think what he's saying now is just crazy stuff. Right. Is that all that he wants? He, he posted a tweet a while back saying the reason that the coronavirus is so bad in the United States is because the hospitals aren't doing scrum. And that is just so repulsive to me. It's so repellent an mm-hmm. idea on so many levels that I can't, and I believe that he believes that. Right. And I, you know, it's, it, it, if, if you're at that level, you're talking about religion now, you're not talking about ways to produce better software. Right. And he, he basically wants to, sell his product as best he can. So there's all this craziness, like, uh, like uh, twice the work and half the time, right? That's just, that's just uh, again, repulsive. That's, that's right. not what Agile has ever been about. Right. Agile has been about getting valuable stuff into your users' hands. Right. And in order to do that, you have to have short feedback loops. Right. Right. So you have to have speed because you've got to have short feedback loops. Right. But you get the speed by making smaller things, not by doing the speed up the work, speed up the work garbage that you right, see right. in the non-agile organizations, right? Is right. The, the, so, but Jeff has just like completely gone over to the dark side and he's saying, right. no, 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 it's all about half the time, right? And I, right. I just, 
it just turns my stomach. I really don't like it. Right. And the problem is, is he is selling something that the, that the faux agile, that the dark agile companies want to hear. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you don't really have to change the way you think about stuff. You can be agile just by like paying for these expensive classes and getting certificates from us. And the big com the companies that don't really want to make any significant changes buy that, mm -hmm. right? Because it fits into their worldview. So as Scrum has taken off precisely because it's not agile, right? The more popular it's gotten, the less agile it's gotten because it's he's pandering to the, to the companies that he's selling certificates to. Right. And I, you know, it's a, it's a bad, it's a bad feedback loop. I don't like it. It's I'm, right. I've been, I've been trying to avoid the word agile if I can right. for reasons like this is I don't want to be associated with that. Right. It's got nothing to do with actually getting good quality, valuable software into so, my customer's hands. It's got nothing to do with making my customers happy. It all right. has to do with surveillance and monitoring and getting people to work harder and stuff that I just, I, I think is the opposite of right. what, what working in an agile way means. So what would be your approach if, a CEO of an organization comes to you and talks about we want to be more agile or become more um, flexible in what we do. How would you talk to them? How would you go about that? What I like to do is I like to sit down with the, ideally with the C-levels, with somebody who's as high in the organization as I can possibly get. Right. And I want to have a conversation. And agile, a lot of agile is about talking. It's about conversations. Right. And I want to say, what's keeping you up at night? What's really worrying you is where, where are, the, where are there pieces of the business that you think are dragging the business down, right? And stuff that's just stopping you from being able to function. And those tend to fall into certain kind of well understood categories. They have to do with, often they have to do with things like not delivering fast enough, but what people really mean by that is that we're not getting stuff that we can sell into our customers' hands fast enough, right? Not, the, right. not delivery in general, but rather the, the delivery of value. And those kinds of things are solvable using real agile and lean techniques. Mm -hmm. So rather than bringing up agile, I'm not interested in agile. I'm not interested in selling agile to somebody. I'm saying, okay, you've got this problem. Okay. Well, here's how we could address that. Right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's learn how to make the units of work smaller so we can release more often. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's uh, get rid of distractions. Let's limit work in progress so that we have, we have fewer distractions and we can get stuff out the door quicker because we're not distracted by all this other stuff that's not going to bring money into the corporation. It's not going to bring value into the corporation. Right. And we can address all of those issues without, without uttering the word agile. It's got nothing to do with process. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with scrum. It has nothing to do with sprints and backlogs and all that other garbage. It has to do with being flexible and doing stuff in small chunks and uh, taking the customer's word seriously and having feedback loops everywhere. And you know, there's a bunch of stuff that it has to do that are basic principles, right. but it has nothing to do with following some process by road. So I talk about their problems then and how we're going to solve them. Right. And I'm an agile guy, which is to say that generally speaking, I believe in doing that incrementally if you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. Right, Rother, I'm sure you're familiar with Rother's uh, improvement kata. Yeah. With this, this idea of you know identify where you are and where you want to go, and then come up with a bunch of small experiments that you can run iteratively to get from here to there. Right. And that's a good way to do it if you can. Is that sometimes you can't. Is that incremental changes I find work best in small and medium sized organizations. It's the big organizations are so screwed up that if you don't do a big bang, everything at once change, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. I've never known a large corporation to go agile. Never, okay. never. I have never. yet. To, well, actually, I, I have two, maybe three times. And right. in those cases, what happened were that the sea levels came in and they said, we're just going to throw out everything we're doing now and fix it. Mm -hmm. Right. The big, the big use case for that that you see is um, ING Bank in New Zealand. That's the one that was been most, most recent, right, where they just said, we're going to do everything. And if that means we have to lay off half of our middle management staff, they're going to go. And they got a lot of pushback from that for obvious reasons, but they did it and they ended up agile on the other side of it. Now, they went through two or three attempts before that that failed. So they understood what didn't work at that point. They really kind of had a good understanding of how to make the transition and the, the, the network for them. But it's possible to do, right? Home Depot did a pretty good job of transitioning over to agile. Um, the, the, it, it can be done. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of com companies can't do it. Any company right. that thinks it's safe is a good idea will never be agile. Right. 
right? So, and if you look at the most of the corporations out there, that's the market for the safe guys, mm -hmm. right? And none of those companies will ever be agile until you can get, get um, C-level leadership in there that says, no, this safe stuff is, is, right. is not what we need and we have to do something else entirely. Yeah. So what's, what's your message to the people that are truly believing in Agile and working not at the sea level, but at the ground level? Maybe they are a scrum master in large organizations. Uh, we are not, uh, we are, you are not telling them to be uh, hopeless, right? Well, <laughs> I, I go back and forth. It's, no, right. I don't think you should be hopeless. Right. Um, I have seen situations where you had a small Agile group within a larger group. Right. And this small agile group was really agile and they basically built a wall around themselves and wouldn't let anybody come in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes literally, I know in one case, they took over a little corner room in a floor, right? There's probably, a, no, I don't know, five teams. And they, they took over a room way off on the side of the building and they literally would not let management in. Oh, they wow. would not let them come into the space. And they were by far the most effective set of groups in the organization. So management was willing to leave them alone because they were doing such good work, but the, they were just not, no, the people who were in charge were very protective. Of, I wouldn't want to say charge, but the, the, the former managers of that group gave up managing, put the management responsibilities onto the teams where they belonged, and mm -hmm. their full-time job was to run interference for the teams and keep the rest of the corporation away. And they did a very good job of that and it worked well. Right. So here we had a small agile organization within a much larger, not, not at all no. agile organization, agile. right? And that larger, not at all agile organization was miserable as they brought in the least qualified, most incompetent agile consultant I've ever seen mm -hmm. who was working right for, working directly from the CTO and she was wrecking havoc everywhere. Right. But this one group was doing pretty well. So that's certainly possible. Um, once that happens in some organizations, the people who are around that group say, well, what are those guys doing? Right. They're all happy. They come into work with a smile on their face. They're doing great work. They're pushing management away so they don't have to deal with any of the garbage that we have to push away, that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And they start paying attention and gradually that small group can grow. It can infuse out to the rest of the organization as a whole. So it's possible. It takes a long time is the downside. Right. So a, a corporation who is saying, OK, we're a big company and we want to be agile in five years. You can't do that starting with little small things and gradually infusing out. It's just not enough time for that. Right? It just doesn't work. It doesn't. So um, some companies have taken the agile units and split them off, spread them, split them off into separate companies, left them alone. Mm -hmm. That works. You know, you look at some. Well, W. L. Gore, of course, is famous for for following Dunbar's numbers when any when any organizational unit gets larger than. 150, 200 people, they split it off to, a, to another company entirely. And that, that works really well for them. But the giant corporations that are determined to not change anything are never going to be agile. I think that really is hopeless. Right. You know, if you have a big corporation that says, okay, we're going to put the PMO in charge of making this agile, and that's a doomed effort to start off with. I know that's going to fail. So oh. you can do little agile stuff. Right. Right, and you can do some things that'll make your life easier. You can right. pair program and do mobbing and things that just sort of make work better, right. make it so that you can be more effective. Right. But you're gonna be pushing back against the rest of the organization all the time. Right. Right. So in Scrum, if you're doing Scrum right, one of the jobs of the SM, and I think probably the most important job of the SM is to push back against the organization, is to protect the team. Mm -hmm. And so if you're really, if you have somebody, whether they call themselves a manager or a scrum master or whatever, but somebody who's willing to make it a full-time job to protect the team from the rest of the organization, well, then the team can be agile. Right. But even then it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to get, uh, to be able to talk to your customers directly. It's going to be hard to get the feedback you need. It's going to be hard to deploy often enough to get, to get valid feedback. Right. Um, there's going to be a bunch of, bunch of obstacles in the way that are going to have to somehow be addressed. Right. And the, it's just, it, it's exhausting is all it, it takes. You're wasting a lot of time and effort and energy right. doing stuff that you should be spending writing code rather than right. pushing back against some right. evil organization. Right. Okay. So, you know, some organizations, you just, some are salvageable. Some of them are not. If it's not the best choice is probably to just walk away if you can. Yeah. Um, hard to do in the current plague environment, yeah. but it, it is possible sometimes somewhere. Yeah. The famous quote, change your organization or change your organization. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> and I, you know, I hate to say that because it sounds so pessimistic, but yeah. you know, there are people that have been following me on Twitter for a while and they work in these horrible places and they talk about it all the time and they're just kind of stuck there and it's a miserable life. And so it's not a life that I would like to lead at least. So if you, if you can't go to work with a smile on your face, you shouldn't be going, you should find someplace else to work. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's just not worth it. <laughs> Maybe it would be challenging at these times because we are in uncharted um, times, but we find ways if you are find, want to find happiness, I believe. Yeah, but you know, don't, don't try and be agile. Right. Don't find happiness by trying to be agile. Learn about agile and learn about lean and try and be happy by taking some of the basic principles and practices and stuff and incorporating them into your work. So right. don't even think about agile. Just think right. about, well... If we could get rid of some of this work in progress, you don't even have to say the words work in progress, right? Yeah, but yeah. if we can get rid of some of this WIP, then our lives will be easier, right? Because <laughs> we won't have all these distractions and stuff. It'll be more fun at work, yeah. right? If I was, if I'm, if I'm pair programming or doing mob programming, it's more fun. I can get more work done faster and I can do it in a way where the work is better and I'm just generally happy. So don't, don't think about, I'm going to be agile. Think about what can I do to make myself happier in this environment and do that, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if it's agile, if it's lean, if it's design thinking, whatever that is. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. Those yeah. labels are just, the, at this I point, those labels yeah. Are, yeah. are a problem, not a help. Is yeah. the, yeah. and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about the labels. Yeah. yeah. Yourself are um, very close to the code as well. You're not one of those coaches that are not close to I, the code. I, you, yeah. No, yeah. I program yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was watching you um, talking about agile architecture for, for I believe it was two hours on YouTube in, mm -hmm. a so in a software conference. And what I really liked, it was a principle that you named after yourself. Ho <laughs> Sorry if I uh, pronounce your last name. Principle. Yes, my replacement yes. principle. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is if you want to be agile, because we talk about lots of agile things at the collaboration level at the process level but this mm -hmm. is the core to the technical level um, and i read that um the whole of replacement principle is you should be able to radically change a class without affecting any of the object that use um that class use the class right i, I yeah. would i would say that goes beyond classes right any any, right. any unit right so a class, unit, a yeah. service or a module whatever whatever it's a recursive principle yeah. it goes yeah. down yeah. to the class level but it goes out yeah. to the service level so yeah, yeah. Um, so tell us more about that. Like, how would you go and introduce that for for the teams and uh, or or the organizations? And um, the the agile is all about being able to make changes quickly. Right. In other words, there's a necessary change, and you want it to get it into your users' hands as fast as you can. And if you are in a world where if you make a small change over here, it impacts. 15 different things elsewhere in the program, right? And in the case of a big, badly done spaghetti code monolith, you can make a small change in one quarter and it can affect thousands of lines of code scattered all over the monolith. It takes months to find them. And in that kind of world, it's not possible to be agile because you can't make a change fast enough. It's, and the, it's not that you can't make a change fast enough, but then you have to waste a huge amount of time making sure that you haven't broken anything. So you make a small, reasonable change, and then you have to waste four months proving to yourself that nothing's broken before you can release. And that that's prevents you from being agile. So the idea of the replacement principle is that if you can replace an implementation without affecting the clients, mm -hmm. what that means is that the thing that you're working on doesn't have any dependency relationships with the clients, mm -hmm. right? In other words, there's nothing, there are no clients that are making any assumptions about how the way that the thing that you're working on right now works under the covers. Right. So if none of the things that are using you know how you work, then you can change the way that you work and they won't be affected. So, you know, there's lots of ways to pull that off. If you're talking about something at the class level, for example, that what that says is that the, the interface in the general sense to the class doesn't change, at least doesn't change much, but the implementation of the interface could change radically and nobody cares. Yeah. So, but that has ramifications too, because then you've got to start designing interfaces in such a way that they can hide implementation in that way. Right. So if your interface is full of get and set functions, for example, your host, because all those get and set functions are accessing fields yeah. inside the class. And that means that you can't ever get rid change of those it. fields yeah. or change their types or anything because all the getters and setters will break and that'll break all the clients. So you've got to start, that forces you to start thinking about not how objects do things, but what they do. 
right? And you start thinking about every module recursively through the system in terms of what does it have to do? What does it do? And at that point, you're not thinking about implementation anymore. You're thinking about activities. You're saying, I need this other thing to do this for me. Right. <laughs> Go do the work and then come back to me when you're done, right? And the, the, it's the same amount of code as you had before, but it's going to be organized very differently. But what that gives you then is once that's all, once all the dust settles, you're in a position where you can start making changes locally and the effect of that change doesn't ripple out of the local area. Mm -hmm. So you can focus on one thing, make the change and have, you know, know that you have a program of things, which means that you can now be agile because you need to make a small change in order to keep a customer happy and you go, you make a change and you're done and you don't have to worry about anything else. So it's all architecture and process and, and code and culture, they're all connected. Connected. So let's talk about that. Um, I wanted to get our conversation to this point and maybe talk about, a little about Meta on this one. Um, would you think that someone as a coach that goes into an organization and want to change them into a more agile way of doing can do that without understanding these kind of concepts? Like, no. or, I think okay. you have, it's all connected. Yeah. Right, and one of the ways that Agile has gone wrong is that people have defined Agile as a process. Mm -hmm. And it's not, right? Is that the people have come to think, well, if I have a backlog and a Scrum Master and a PO and yada, 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 I'm Agile, and that's not true, right? Because right? if, if you're fighting your code, you can't be Agile in the English sense of the word, right? You can't be flexible and adaptable and, and graceful and all of these other things that the word Agile means if, it takes a month to make a change to a small piece of code. So the, one of the biggest mistakes I think organizations make when they quote transition to agile is they imagine that they can live with their existing horrific big ball of mud monolith and still be agile. And that's probably not right. Probably right. the code is going to drag you back and prevent you from being able to make changes fast enough. Right. So um, it's, it's everything is connected to everything else. There's no, you know, and it, it, it goes even beyond the, the you know, things like soft things like culture and stuff. It goes to the physical workplace. It right. goes, even if we were working remote, it goes to the physical working equipment, right? Both of us, I notice, are set up so that we can look directly at each other as we're speaking. Right. And that's important, right? But how many times have you like tried to have a meeting with somebody remotely and they're like looking yeah. like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it exactly. means you can't connect, right? And you can't yeah. communicate at a right. proper level. And yeah. we have, since we do this a lot, right? We've all yeah. got good equipment. We've got good microphones and we can hear, hear each other clearly and that kind yeah. of stuff. And it makes this conversation possible. And if we were fighting that equipment, we couldn't have a conversation. And if we couldn't have the conversation and we had been talking, the conversation was about code, we couldn't yeah. make the code go easier either, right? So it impacts everything. It affects the physical... Right environment as much as it impacts things like culture and and process and that kind right. of stuff um it reminds me of um a talk that i believe dave gave um one of the agile signatories gave that talk at um go to conference i believe it's 2015 it says agile is dead and he's talking about the first thing he's talking about is that people are calling this agile manifesto but if you look at this it, manifesto for agile software development so in the yeah. in the title even if it's software but people forget that software piece they focus on other pieces let's change the culture let's change the process right yeah but and again then, i think it's all connected again it's all connected. Right? So you yeah. can't you can't do the software unless you've got a culture that supports it right. so i there, there's kind of a movement in on twitter at least about people that are pushing back against this notion of agile has anything to do with software Mm -hmm. like it's like it's, if it's not explicitly called out in the manifesto, it's got nothing to do with agile. And I, I don't buy that. It's that it seems to me that the goal here is agility, right. and every anything that touches that is relevant. And there are lots of things that touch that, and culture is certainly one of them. Right. Right? Process is one of them. Tools are one of them. There's a lot of stuff right. that affects that. And the the goal is agility, though. The goal is to be able to get valuable stuff into our customers' hands as fast as we can. That's the, if we can't do that, we failed. So whatever we have to touch to make that work, we have to touch, be it, be it culture or tools or whatever. So, I, you know, I, it, but it is, it, I do think it is a software in the sense that I, I hear a lot of, you know, we used Agile to make cars or something like that. And I, I, my, you know, more power to them, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that means. 
you know, right? So, <laughs> my expertise is entirely in software. I don't know how you could take any of this and apply it to anything else really is the, you know, lean, right? You look at lean, there's a lot of lean that we borrow from manufacturing, but we're not running factories, right? There's a lot of lean that has no relevance to software development at all because we're not right. running factories, right? And even things like a Kanban board, right? A Kanban board assumes a factory. It assumes a linear flow of materials from workstation to workstation. And that's not the way software development works. Yeah. So those things, you know, that's, that's handy. It's a, it gives us valuable ways to think about stuff, but if we're really going to adapt it to software, we've got it. We can't just pull it into our world. We have to adapt it to our world, you know, and lean itself, right? The big thing with lean, I, there's a, one of um, Tom and Mary Poppendick's books. It's the, first, it's the first one. I can't remember the title off the top of my head. The one about lean, lean software, software development. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, she has a chapter in there where she's talking. There's a story about, about uh, the Numi plant in, in yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, just that's a lean down, software just development. Down the street from where I lived while well, it was still working. Yeah. And the, what happened there, though, there was a joint effort with General Motors. And the Toyota guys came in and they set up this very lean environment. It was very successful. And then they, being guides from Detroit, documented it down to the letter. And they took this big stack of documents back to Detroit. <laughs> and they said, do this. And it failed completely, right? Did not work in Detroit. The lesson here is that what they needed to take to Detroit were the principles and the values that the people in Fremont were using to develop processes that worked for them. True. Right. And the, the not, not, nobody else could use those processes. Processes, they only work for the people that develop. Right. So Scrum probably worked just fine for Ken Schwaber's original Scrum team. I have no argument, no, no, no disbelief about that. Whether you can then take that process and move it to another team, that I'm really doubtful about. Right. And what you can move are the values and the principles. And more and more, the people who I respect who are teaching Scrum, people like Ryan Ripley, are saying that. Here are the values, here are the principles. How does what we do fit with the principles of Scrum? And the values of Scrum, and I, 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 I'm absolutely behind that. I would agree with that completely, because that's more, much more important than things like, you know, backlog, how the backlog is organized, and story points, and all this other kind of stuff. How does it fit with the values? And then develop your own process. I think I was listening to a podcast with with Ken that he was talking about how they come up with the sprint planning, a sprint retrospective, and all that. And he was telling the story that they looked at the calendar of the teams that he was working with, and mm -hmm. they were trying to find out what the purpose of each is, and they they merge it so that it it fits that that team's purpose, and mm -hmm. that's how they come up with those. So, back to you, your your um your point to the principles of what Agile and Scrum are supposed to be. Uh, think about what are, are the uh, ceremonies or uh, events that yeah. you want to have, not just blindly follow. Right. Uh, blindly follow some process, right? right. Looking at you, if you look at the original paper, right? Nanaka's uh, 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 new, the new, new product development game, right? Yeah. Uh, which needs some hyphens. And <laughs> yeah. It's not actually new, new product. It's the new, new product development game, right? <laughs> but um, they're talking about working collaboratively. They're talking about tight feedback loops. They're talking, talking about important stuff, but they're not talking about a specific process. At no point did they say, here's a process that you should follow in order to be successful, right? They're talking about principles and values. And I, I think that's important. It's a great paper, by the way. If anybody hasn't yeah. read it, they should. Yeah, highly recommend it as well. Yeah. I recently um, saw a tweet from you, if I remember correctly, um, so let me let me say it this way. So typically when I work with teams, I, we talk about quality. It's not one person's role. Uh, it's um, everyone's role. And they, they might call people QAs. I typically call them testers, but it's everyone's role. I, I saw a tweet from you recently. It was uh, something like this. Architecture is not a role. It's an art. Well, the, what I said is that it's not a, it's not a role. It's a skill. It's a skill. It's an art yeah, too. Yeah. I, right. I wouldn't disagree with you, though. Right. I think it's an art, too. Right, right. It's the... <laughs> But it's a skill. Yeah, it's not a role, right. though. Right. Anybody can be an architect. Right, right. And I've been, I've been having a back and forth with Simon Brown, right. uh, uh, that same thread. Right? Right. This is just last week. And the, the, Simon is sort of more of a, well, you know, architecture is a hard job and not everybody can do it. And, you know, there are certain people that are very skilled at it and other people that aren't. And the role of an architect is, 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 is a role. Right. And I understand where he's coming from, but I think, I think we actually disagree about this. Because from my point of view, Everybody is doing architecture 
every time you write a line of code, mm -hmm. you're also doing architecture. Right. So the question then becomes how good is the architecture? Not whether or not you're doing it, you're doing it willy nilly, right? But right. the less you know, the lower the quality of the architecture is gonna be. So we all must learn about architecture because it's so intimately tied into the code right. that we're writing. And if we're writing in an agile way, we don't have time to go to some grand architect somewhere and get permission to make changes. We just have to make them. Right. So if we make the wrong changes and mess things up, everybody suffers. And so we can't do that. So the only practical solution to that is for everybody to develop architectural skills. And that still doesn't mean that everybody's going to have the same level of skills as you solve that problem by working as a team. Right. And the, I'm a huge fan of things like mob programming. I'm a huge fan of collaborative working. And if, if I, I, you know, it's been a while since I put it, I was a CTO for a company, but it's been a while now, eight, 10 years. But the, if I were to do a CTO thing again, I would have everybody mob programming from day one mm -hmm. and I would build the teams around a culture of mobbing mm -hmm. and basically wouldn't hire anybody who wasn't interested in doing it. And the reason for that is that a team working together as a team collaboratively can always do better work than a per single person can. So if you talk about a mob of six people in which one of them is really an excellent architect and one of them is a really mediocre one and everybody else is in the middle somewhere, the group together is going to come up with a good architecture. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, if you talk about taking a team of six and splitting them up into six individuals, each of which goes off into their little corner and types away and they talk to each other once a day in a, in a, in a daily scrum or a stand up, you're going to have lousy architecture because you won't be talking to people and getting help and coming up with collaborative solutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, from my point of view, for Agile to really work, there is that word again, you have to be working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, disturbs me about all of the remote stuff that's been going on in the last, last couple of months is that in some companies, it is pushing people to work as individuals isolated from everybody else talking once a day to the other people on the quote team, but it's not really a team anymore. Right. Right? If you work by yourself all day and you only talk to other people once a day, that's not a team anymore. I don't know what that is, but it's not a team. And it doesn't have to work that way. I just did a, a workshop for a client and we spent four days doing mob programming and test driven development. Mm -hmm. And it was, you were doing it on zoom and we were using, um, Moreau, I think it was Moreau. It was either Moreau or Mural as a, as a shared whiteboard. And um, we were, everybody had their own development environment, but we were doing a, gish, a git push pull to, to change drivers. And it was working fine, right? As everybody was working as a team, is the driver switch was taking a little longer than I was expecting one to have happen. Right. Right? There were glitches here and there, but it was, it was nothing serious. And um, so here we have a remote team that really is working as a team, right? They were literally talking to each other and, working together as a team, and that worked great, right? It's not, it's not like remote has anything inherently bad with it. Right. But if you don't have a culture that encourages that kind of, of collaboration, then the remote working pushes people in the wrong direction, it pushes them away, it pushes them towards working right. alone rather than working together. And that's, that would be very unfortunate if that becomes a stronger tendency than it already has been with people working co-located in offices. It's a challenge. Hopefully we all get over. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to learn how to do it. I think right. it, it, there's been a lot of people guessing about what things are going to be like moving forward. Twitter just right. announced the other day that they're going to let everybody be hundred percent remote forever. I don't, oh, okay. I don't know how that's going to work. No, I, practically speaking, what I find is that you've got to get together physically once or twice a week to work optimally. And the, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with flexible schedules and that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. you have to phys have physical conversations occasionally mm -hmm. in order to do the best work. And I think we're probably going to end up somewhere in the middle like that, where people mm -hmm. people will be able to work remotely more so than before. Yeah, and it's not a typical work remotely because in Canada, right, you can't send your uh, child to the daycare or like to the school. Everything is closed, right? It's, it's not working remotely independently. You're working remotely with your family in the house. So yeah, that adds right. to the complexity of. It does. It adds to the. It, it adds. <laughs> it adds to the complexity only if you define work as something that is in that humans don't do, right? <laughs> I I think work is a human activity, and if what that mean if what that means is that our kids and our dogs are around, well, fine. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, people people 
right? I don't, I don't want to seem negative, but here you've got your, your background behind you, your Zoom background behind you, right? And that's fine here because you've got a podcast and you're trying to, right. trying to brand it. And that's, that's, a, that's a good use of that. Right. But a lot of people are putting like, that ridiculous Zoom beach behind, right. behind themselves when they're talking and that kind of stuff. And that, I see that as nothing but kind of a weird distraction as I would much rather just see whatever room they're in. Right. And they're, but they, they think that there's this, it's not being professional if, I, if you can see the space that I'm actually working in. I'm mm -hmm. not being professional if you can see my kids run, run, run behind me or my dog comes up or my cat jumps in my lap. And I, it seems to me that that's the height of being professional because mm -hmm. being professional is being a human being. And, no, I completely right? agree. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with you. But in cases, in cases that you need to pay attention to your kid, for example, and you need to leave, for example, then it's going to add more complexity. That's to a good reason. No, but see, that's a good reason to do my programming. Right. One of the things right. about yeah, mob, exactly. mob programming is the mob always moves forward, yeah, even yeah. if an individual has to drop out for a few minutes and then come right. back in. Yeah. Right? So if you're True. mob programming and everybody's working at home with their kids and stuff, well, if you need to take a few minutes off to deal with a kid having a breakdown hmm. in the other room, well, just do it, right? It's not a problem. It's the mob will continue to make the work move forward. Okay. It's actually what, a very good selling point in these times for mob programming. I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> At least if you do it right, right? So yeah, like people, yeah. people who object to mob programming think you're somehow chained to your desk and you are <laughs> <laughs> handcuffed to the people in the mob. And it doesn't mm -hmm. work that way, right? It's, yeah. it's the point is that the mob does work. And the mob's composition, though, is changing dynamically over time, mm -hmm. depending on what people need to do. And if you need mm -hmm. to take care of a kid, that's fine. If you need to look something up on, on uh, Google, that's fine too, right? Is what, right? Whatever you need to do is you, you go do it. But meanwhile, work is continuing to move forward. So uh, I, I think, it, as you say, it fits really nicely into uh, into the current situation. Right. I, I wish more, you know, I, 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 it works so well and it's right. so much fun that I, uh, I had become something of an evangelist for it without really intending to be, right. just because I'm really kind of excited about it as a way of working. And the, right. the, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to work. And the people that are object, object to it, there's kind of two classes of people. There's the kind of people that don't really know how it works, so they can't imagine it, right? They think, uh, how, could, how could it be effective for five people to sit around and watch somebody work, right. when in fact, it's really five people working and one person taking notes. It's a different, right. It's a right. different dynamic to that. Um, and they pick it up almost immediately is that mm -hmm. if I sit down and do a workshop where we just do it, right? I, I, I find that you can't teach mob programming and test driven development by giving a lecture, do it, right? So when I do TDD workshops and when I do mob programming workshops, we just sit down and do it. It goes slowly at first and then it gets faster and faster and faster. And I'd, I'd like to take a week, a week of half days works fine. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the end of the week, everybody knows what they're doing. And at that point, most of the people that are doing it, they don't want to do anything else really. The, the, but then there are a few people in the profession that joined the profession because they are kind of antisocial. I, I don't want to use that word really. It's not a good word, but they don't really like working with other people. They want to work by themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't feel comfortable working with other people. And that's why they went into programming. Mm -hmm. And I, the, I have some sympathy for that. They can't work in mobs though, right? Because it's mm -hmm. going to be too uncomfortable for them. So any company that's doing mob programming also has to figure out some way to leverage the people that can't work in the mobs. So there has to, you know, and there's certainly, there's always plenty of work to do. Unfortunately, sometimes it's seen as low value work. So somebody who wants to work alone, they can be put onto fixing bugs forever. There's yeah. usually an yeah. infinite yeah. supply of bugs that need fixing, but yeah. for some reason people see that as low value work. It's not, it's so often it's the most important work you can do is to get the yeah. bugs fixed, but they see it as a kind of a demotion to be, to yeah, be set to work bugs. fixing bugs. But <laughs> But the, the nature of the profession is changing. True. And software development has, it's moving away from this notion of the isolated individual, right? Is put him in an office and throw meat under the door. Mm -hmm. And it's turning into, a, into a, a social, collective, collaborative enterprise. And that's going to leave some people behind. And I, I have some sympathy for them, but I, it's life, right? As things evolve. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's better. I certainly having worked in both kinds of worlds, I, I, um, I like bobbing and things like that way better than I liked working alone mm -hmm. by myself. And I'm an introvert, yeah. right? So I don't buy the argument. Oh, I'm an introvert. I can't mob programming. I'm, I'm a hardcore introvert. So I, I, and I love mob programming. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It was, it was um, eye opening for me when I did it myself. Yeah. It's always eye opening, mm -hmm. and, but you have to do it, right? Yeah, you, just you have to do it. it. You, yeah. you have to yeah. do it.
Uh, you can't you can lecture people on tdd or these things they have to do it like when i do when i uh, was doing some lift out for teams i added when they were coming to the from the break i was doing a, a little bit of tdd like what is the next test we do and there were people from the business side and i'm like why are we coding like we are we don't supposed to be and it's it's i was telling them that the product that you're putting out there is a software and after two days that we did we did that they came and say oh now we know more about what we are putting out it, it's better for them to understand that so yeah well that's part of it. the other part of it they don't even have to go down to that level though yeah because right? yeah. the after a week or two you'll be putting out better quality stuff than you were doing before at equal or better speed right so if all you if you have like a non-technical person and that's all that they see right, right more output right. um they'll be happy right they don't really care how you go about doing it it's, they, right. they might be dubious but <laughs> you know if you're only talking about a couple of weeks to try it out there's not much to lose in trying right. Right. so um you might as well try it and right. the, the results are pretty immediate and pretty impressive usually right. so we are kind of coming to an end alan um mm -hmm. if uh, you have to leave our audience with one thing that you want uh, to tell them advice some some something that you want to share with them um what would that be you know the i guess the main thing now is that more and more the whole notion of agile and stuff doesn't mean much to me is that what's important to me is working together with other human beings in order to produce the best stuff that I can. Mm -hmm. I can use Agile and Lean in other techniques to do that. But the, the, the issue is to not, is to do what the Agile Manifesto says and to focus on the people mm -hmm. and not on the process and not on the tools and not on all this other stuff, but just focus on the people and thinking, okay, as a, as a bunch of people, how can we work together best to get stuff done to produce high quality stuff and to have a good time while we're doing it. If you're not, if you're not smiling while you're working, then you have got to find something else to do for a living. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, 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 if your focus isn't that, then I guess my advice is to try and make your focus that is to right. focus more on working with people and collaborating and doing things like that and mm -hmm. forget about the process stuff. It's not that right. important. Right. Exactly. I was talking to another speaker on, on the show. He was telling us it doesn't matter if you're doing agile or not and how to figure if you're doing agile. If you are doing if you are not doing agile, you know that. You don't need yeah. to go around about it. Like you, you Well the test is simple, right? Customer comes up and says, God, I hate this. Or they come up and say, I really need this. Right. And you say, Hold on. And then you go, Here it is. <laughs> Right. And they go, yeah, that's what I want, <laughs> right? Then you're agile. That's what agile right. is. Right? Right. Yeah. However you can pull that off, you're agile, right? That's fine. <laughs> so before, before ending up, I have one last question for you, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anyone that um, inspired you in the past? If, um, is there anyone that uh, you want to name them or uh, refer to them for the people to follow and learn from, other than yourself, obviously? You know, the people that I that I learned the most from were people that you have never heard of. They're people who mentored me when I was just starting out programming, for example. People that I learned from at work who just kind of taught me how to do what I'm doing as a human being and be good at it and stuff. Uh, the They are sort of this vast mass of mm -hmm. un, un, unheralded mentors that make everybody who they are and you know there's a lot of people who i've read through the ages and in some cases gotten to know who i think very highly of who've helped me a lot like people like um, jerry weinberg for example um yeah. that of course they were instrumental in sort of changing the way i think and teaching me things that i didn't know before but in terms of just being who i am and being really good at what i do that's more an attitude thing, I think, than a, mm -hmm. than a specific knowledge thing. Okay. And the people that are important to me are the people that I've worked with who were willing to take the time and sit down with a green kid who didn't know what the hell he was doing and be patient with him and kind of really teach him how to, how to do the work, how to program. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for people like that, I don't think I could be doing what I am doing now. So th those are the people that I value most. Or the, okay mentors that i've had through the ages so if you're not doing that for kids who are working for you right. do it right yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's probably the most important thing that right. you can yeah. do is mentor people and help right. them and be patient with that. and be patient and and teach them teach them the stuff that's not in the books right the stuff right. that they need in order to actually get the work done right. yeah. awesome again thank you alan for being on the show is there anything else that uh, we want to 
before saying goodbye? I can't think of anything offhand. Yeah. Talked yeah. I've talked about a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sometimes I think I talk too much, but anyway, yeah. it was fun. So yeah. you're welcome. Uh, so we put um, your uh, contact information for people to get in touch with you on the show notes if you need anything to put okay. there. Um, please. Um, Just my, my email and my Twitter, right, is yeah. I'm at, at Alan Holub and I'm Alan at Holub.com. So that's mm -hmm. relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And my DM is open on Twitter. So feel free to get in touch with me. And I also, I'm also on LinkedIn, but mm -hmm. I don't check my LinkedIn e email that much. So okay. Twitter or email is the best way to get me. Okay. And of course, if I can be like totally self serving for a moment, I'd like everybody else nowadays could do some work. So. Right. <laughs> If you want me to come in and do a workshop for you or, or just talk to you about what it means to be agile and maybe help your organization move ahead, give me a call and we can set something up and have a chat. Thank you again so much for being on the show, Alan. You're welcome. My pleasure.